From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South, and I am Saini Gray. We are currently waiting on a decision from Brazil's Supreme Court on former President Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva's petition to remain free as he fights a 12-year sentence on corruption charges. Lula's appeal was rejected last month, leaving his faith in the hands of the Supreme Court. If granted habeas corpus, the former president will be free and allowed to continue appealing his case. The same court has already upheld Lula's conviction on taking bribes and money laundering. Today's ruling will determine if Lula will remain a presidential candidate for October's vote. He's currently leading the polls. His supporters say they will continue to fight for him. We have a national agenda of demonstrations. We will walk to the Supreme Court and will ask that Lula get his best corpus granted. We will defend Lula's right to answer to justice without being incarcerated. And we will defend it until the last resort the right to follow a legal process key in a democracy. Now Brazil's armed forces are putting pressure on the court. An army general has said there will be a military intervention if the Supreme Court doesn't move forward with Lula's imprisonment. He added that the armed forces will have to restore public order if the Supreme Court's decision sparks violent protests in the country. And in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, right-wing protesters took to the streets to call for Lula's arrest. The chief of Brazil's Supreme Court, Carmen Lucia, has urged people to remain calm ahead of the ruling and said that ideological differences should not be the source of social disorder. Members of the Brazilian community are demanding the Supreme Court respect Lula da Silva's right to be presumed innocent. At the University of Brasilia, professors and law students had an open forum about democracy and respect for the Constitution. This is an unusual moment in our democracy, if we can even call it a democracy. We are living with fascist attacks and our social movements are being suppressed. According to lawyers, sending Lula to jail before analyzing all the appeals is not only unconstitutional, but a threat to democracy. It's better to have free criminal than a condemned innocent if we have doubts about his behavior. And there are doubts because the case is still being discussed. If he's jailed, then democracy has been compromised and the Supreme Tribunal has betrayed its role. Left-wing social movements have taken to the streets. They say they will continue to defend the man that represents hope for thousands of Brazilians. We have a schedule of demonstrations. People will come to Brasilia. We will demonstrate near the Supreme Tribunal to ask for Lula's habeas corpus, to defend Lula's freedom, and to fight for real democracy. Lula could be condemned to 12 years in prison. His supporters say there's no proof of corruption, and this is a ploy to stop him from running in the upcoming elections. Our correspondent Ignacio Limas has more from Sao Paulo. This is an important day for former President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, as today he will learn the Supreme Court's decision on his 12-year sentence. Lula's supporters are gathering here outside the Metal Workers Trade Union in Sao Bernardo. They belong to the Homeless Workers Movement, and also they're from different social and union organizations as well as political leaders who are supporting Lula as he goes through this process which is aimed at excluding him from the presidential race. The demonstrators are here outside the Metal Workers Union because it was here that Lula's influence and leadership first began. They're waiting for Lula and for the Supreme Court hearing that will decide on the habeas corpus petition he filed in the hope of avoiding the implementation of his 12-year prison sentence on corruption charges. We'll keep you informed as the events unfold. We thank Ignacio Limas for that report. In Colombia, the killing of former FARC militants continues. On Tuesday, 32-year-old Nelson Andreas Zapata Urego, who was part of the reincorporation process into society, was shot several times and his body was then abandoned on the road.
Social movements are asking the Colombian government to guarantee safety for the territories in the northeast part of the country. This last murder occurred in the Antioquia department, one of the areas where narco paramilitary groups are getting stronger. And with more than 300 members of social leaders over the last two years being murdered, Colombia is witnessing the rise of the Gulf Clan, the most powerful narco paramilitary group in the country. This new generation of paramilitaries has set aside its anti-insurgent strategy to transform itself into a criminal organization that sells its services to the highest bidder. They are a business holding in real life. They sell drug trafficking routes and look over them. They have coca plantations, they do mining, blackmail, people trafficking, and run prostitution in cities like Medellin. I think nothing speaks more clearly than the figures in Antioquia, which has seen the highest number of social leaders being killed. Human rights organizations in Antioquia published a report where one can clearly see an increase in the murder rate, along with threats and other forms of persecution of human rights defenders. This is worrying because it's linked to other phenomena, such as the consolidation in certain territories of illegal players who are taking over areas the FARC left after demobilizing and who are increasingly gaining strength. So what do we know of the Gulf clan? Well, intelligence reports suggest that this criminal organization is only getting stronger. The Gulf Clan exercises control over almost all Colombian territory. The government says it is funded by drug trafficking, illegal mining and extortion, and that money is laundered in real estate and international franchises. The organization emerged in 2007, two years after the demobilization of another paramilitary group called the United Self-Defense Forces of Colombia. That left a void in the drug and extortion business. In its 11-year history, the Gulf Clan has expanded to at least 17 departments of the country. It is particularly strong in Colombia's northern region in the departments of Antioquia, Choco, and Cordoba. It also has a strong presence at the borders with Venezuela and Panama. The government believes the Clan has also extended its network with drug cartels in Costa Rica, Honduras, Panama, Guatemala, and Mexico, including the famous Sinaloa cartel, whose head, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, is on trial in the United States. Just last year, Colombia said the Klan's membership halved after a major offensive by the government. However, now it warns the Gulf Clan is planning attacks on police. It also holds the group responsible for terror attacks against the public, including threatening and murdering social leaders. Colombia's financial regulator has given FARC members access to financial services. The move came after it learned that several banks would not let members open bank accounts. The regulator said the former combatants must be treated as equals. It added that the party needs access to financial services to reintegrate into civil society. The FARC signed a peace agreement with the government in September 2016 to end hostilities, reform, and unite with the rest of society. So we're going to take a short break, but join us again after a look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting.
welcome back. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro has condemned an attack against the opposition presidential candidate Henry Falcon. He says seven people have been detained in connection with the offense which happened in the Caracas neighborhood of Katia. Falcon's security boss sustained a head injury in the attack after being hit with a brass knuckle. Maduro asked justice officials to ensure those responsibles are punished and Maduro rejected accusations that pro-government tug thugs were to bl blame for the attack. I condemn the attack and the aggression against presidential candidate Henry Falcón's caravan. The moment I was aware of what occurred, I ordered an investigation. I can announce that there are already 17 people arrested and I will make sure that everyone involved in the aggression against Henry Falcón will be punished by. There has been another explosion in the Ecuadorian province of Esmeraldas near the border with Colombia. It comes after a series of attacks in the area and the kidnapping of three journalists last week. A communique from the government in Quito says that the blast occurred at around 1.45 in the morning in Viche. There were no victims and no buildings were damaged. It said an investigation is underway and it called on citizens to remain calm. The caravan carrying 1,200 Central American immigrants has reportedly abandoned plans to head to the U.S. border. This comes amid other reports that say the group has been splintering into smaller units. The caravan has infuriated U.S. President Donald Trump and prompted him to threaten to cut foreign aid to Honduras. In response, the Honduran government defended the steps it has taken to reduce immigration from the country. It says it has tackled cartel violence and strengthened the economy. The government added that it is one of the most successful countries in the region in combating immigration. We really have advanced on the immigration issue. We think that the claims made by the United States President are not fair given what we have done so far. Also, all of these efforts to tackle immigration are predominantly financed by taxes paid by the Honduran people. The help from the United States is welcome. It is important, but it should not come at the expense of our country's dignity. That is our position. We're going to continue working on this issue. Now, Honduras is not the only country to have reacted to Donald Trump's declarations. Mexico also responded to U.S. President's threat to send the U.S. military to the border. In an official statement, the Mexican government defended its sovereignty regarding migration policies. It says Mexican authorities are trying to ensure that migration occurs legally, safely, orderly, and with full respect for people's rights. The migrant caravan started its journey about 10 days ago from the Guatemala-Mexico border in search of a better life. They are running away from poverty and violence in their native countries. They know the risk of crossing Mexico without papers, where migrants are targets of extortion, kidnapping, and even murder. That's why they are asking the government for security. We want stability for those who are vulnerable and departure documents, humanitarian visas, or some kind of paper to move through this country in the best possible way. A large part of this group comes from Honduras, 250 children who are traveling with them are also victims of hunger and face injustice. We have the right to progress and to get a better life for our children. There are mothers all alone here. They say that we are taking advantage of this, but we just want the best for our kids. Crime doesn't let us live in our countries. The caravan has caught Donald Trump's attention. He has even announced that he will mobilize troops to the border while the wall is being built. This wall idea is many years old. It's existed since President Clinton's government, and now it's being built. What Donald Trump wants is to modernize it. The Mexican government reacted to Trump's declaration a few hours later. The Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Luis Videgaray Caso, asked Washington to clarify the declarations about the militarization of the border. Mexico's president also called for calm. We have continued negotiations and I have hopes the good nature and cordiality of our souls continues. But above all, we must continue to search for results that benefit all three countries that are part of NAFTA. Social organizations and migrant families consider the Mexican government's actions too weak to face its northern neighbor. 
They're also worried and upset about migrants being used in exchange for the renegotiation of NAFTA, the economic agreement between the two countries and Canada. Former Bolivian President Gonzalo Sanchez de Lozada has been found guilty of involvement in the massacre of 67 people in 2003 by a court in the United States. Government Minister Carlos Romero has demanded the extradition of Lozada to face justice in Bolivia. Families of the victims celebrate, celebrated the court's decision, which demands that Sanchez de Lozada compensate victims with $10 million. Well, it's a great victory for us. And well, we hope this sentence will hold. For us, it's something unexpected and something permanent that we'll be writing into the history of our country, that Gonzalo Sánchez de Lozada has been found guilty for the events of October and September 2003. And our correspondent in La Paz, Freddy Morales, has more on the background to this case. The tribunal's decision against former President Gonzalo Sánchez de Lozada is expected to come to a close any day now. The civil trial was initiated by nine family members of the victims of the 2003 massacre. In 2003, 67 people were gone down and almost 400 injured in an uprising in the city of El Alto against natural gas being exported. The demonstrators were calling for money from the sale to be used for the development of the country. This massacre forced Lozada and his ministers to flee Bolivia for the U.S., where they were granted political asylum. Bolivian extradition requests have been rejected. The process is being handled in a federal court near Miami, where nine family members of the victims are taking part. Lozada has denied that he is a millionaire despite flaunting his wealth while living in Bolivia. The jury's verdict must be unanimous, which is raising concern that if the verdict is not resolved, it could result in an annulment. The first summit of indigenous peoples of Ibero-America will take place in Guatemala over the next two days. With information on what attendees can expect, here's our correspondent, Mario Rosales. From April 4 to 6, the first summit of high indigenous and ancestral authorities from Ibero-America will take place in Guatemala west of the capital city in Antigua. There will be debate and technical tables for indigenous youth, women and elders from different communities of Ibero-America. This is the first continental event of this kind, looking to present the indigenous communities' positions and claim their rights in front of the Ibero-American summit, also set for November in Guatemala. The main goal of this meeting in Antigua, Guatemala, is to establish the main issues affecting indigenous communities in the region and identify the solutions that should be suggested to the government in order to respect the rights of indigenous peoples. That is what will be discussed in the first summit of indigenous peoples of Ibero-America. Mexican environmentalists and social groups are banding together to denounce a law that supposedly protects biodiversity, but actually favors mining companies and international corporations. Scientists, indigenous and social leaders are resisting a biodiversity law that they say is tailor-made to benefit mining companies and international corporations. They are literally removing all restrictions and handing out permits that allow the extraction of species at risk of extinction. Mexican artists have joined the call to expose the risks that this law brings with it. This biodiversity law allows applicants to patent and commercialize nature as if it was theirs. The proposal was approved in the Senate at the end of the last year. If the law is approved by the Congress, it is not only the environment that's at risk. This law means we lose the natural resources of our country. Those resources mean food for us. Experts denounce the conflict of interest here, since the Green Party and the PRI party senators are the ones who initiated the bill and have family ties with the businessmen that benefit from it. The big companies that have controlled the country and that have most of the wealth have established a new route to extract natural resources through this new law, which gives them easier access to the country's biodiversity. Environmental groups point out that the law was approved illegally. The decision sees this project go against state obligation to safeguard more than 25 million hectares of protected areas that exist in the country. Time now for another break, but join us again after a look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting.